So we're officially starting the October Los Angeles Astronomical General Meeting, 802 and 10. I uh, welcome in everybody. Uh, got a lot of people today. We got? we got 41 people. Good. Um, first, let me say uh, the new members. If there's new members here, let's uh, let's see who you are. Anyone? A new member today, Morgan. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how did you find us? Why did you join? Yeah, I discovered the club a little over 30 years ago when I started working at Griffith Observatory. Oh. Ah. And uh, just was a little slow for signing up. <laughs> <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I, I lost the application and then I found it. <laughs> found it 30 years later. <laughs> Well, great. So you still work at Griffith, yes? I do. Okay, good. I do. Yep. That's. Yep. All right. So you got a, another another astro astronomical outlet. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, other new members? Anybody else find their way in? I see my buddy Steve Cooperman is here as well. Hi, Steve. All right. Lecturer Hi. Up there. Although all of our screens only have a crowd. Okay. All right, well, me... um, we had a very successful 100-inch um, night on October 1st, which was uh, our first 100-inch night for since, uh, I think, maybe three years, could have been four years. The year before COVID, uh, we got clouded out or rained out, so we didn't go that year. And then we had two years of COVID, so we finally got our 100-inch. Uh, three years later, it was, it was a good night, so lots of good things. Uh, the next couple of things coming up um, are a couple of star parties. Public star parties at Mount Wilson have been okayed uh, for October 22nd and November 19th. So both of those nights are going to be probably fairly heavily um, social media, some advertising. We're getting a lot more. Uh, a lot more people. The last star party was quite successful. So we are on for the 22nd and the 19th. On November 19th is also our last 60 inch night. So we'll be concurrent with the uh, upper upper parking lot star party. Uh, and uh, that'll be the last one for the year. The other important night is going to be October 29th at Garvey Ranch Park. We're having our Halloween slash science slash new member night because we didn't do any of those for the past two years either. So we're putting them all together. We're going to have a big bash. It's looking pretty good. Um, so put those down in your calendars uh, and, and we should be doing all of those things, I think. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. Um, we should do committee reports, or should I just, uh, what do we have? John, John, do you have anything to say about our financial uh, situation for the, for the general meeting? All right. Am I muted? Okay. No, you're no. good. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I uh, did not intend to uh, have a report for tonight. I'm sorry. Okay. I do I have a Lockwood report, a few Lockwood reports things to mention. A Lockwood report would be good. And, and your report on Wednesday at the board meeting was fine. I mean, we're, we're fine. We are not in any financial trouble. We're doing okay. We got membership is strong. Uh, people are staying. So that part's good. So what's happening at Lockwood? We can do the Lockwood report. So the country contractor is going to be out there Friday. He's going to pull uh, two stumps uh, that are in really terrible places in the middle of the observing area and grade and level those. He's going to port and then he's going to grade for two new pads with pier bases and he's going to grade and pour for the uh, the footers for the 10 by 10 tough shed roll off roof observatory. Great. Concrete pour is going to be next week, but the, he's going to be doing the grading, all the all the earth moving on Friday. So the the 
there may be a couple of big holes out there that people have to avoid if they're out there this weekend. Okay, and all of that is uh, all their labor. Do we need to provide anything during an, either of those visits? No. Okay, great. All right. Uh, We've had a couple of good outreaches and we're continuing to have them. Um, is there anything coming up that, uh, I'm not real plugged into the outreach because I can't get there. But, um, who's here that's doing outreach? That would be Evan. Zali, Evan or, or Zali. Um, what's the next one, Zali? Do you, do you have a calendar on the outreaches? You're, you're muted. You're still muted. One minute. <laughs> so one He's looking it up on his calendar. Okay, maybe. yeah, I'm looking. Hang on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for the all you guys who just show up at the outreaches, outreach after outreach. Thank you very much. I mean, we're we are handling them, and it seems to be. I mean, I don't go to too many, but I hear that they are going well. And we're getting more uh, popular. And Chris, how are you? Um, you're going up forward with the uh, flyers. I mean, the uh, information. Yes. Okay, uh, great. Let's see. We... Oh, he froze. Hey, hey. uh, Daryl, there was a, a new a new uh, member there, Ann Rodriguez, that shows up on the chat. That we ah, can okay. say hi to. Sure. Oh, Chris may have to jump back in. Uh, Okay. Did you find it? Did you find anything, Zali? Oh, there he is. You unfroze. Okay. Uh, yes, we're gonna go ahead and look at those, and uh, we've got some great ideas. We're gonna go ahead and streamline the information, make it uh, more future-proof and a little generic. Uh, so just the description of the club and make it look uh, more appealing. But we can use some of what we've got already there. Uh, but just gonna make it a little more branded, uh, okay. a little more corporate, a little more corporate looking. Okay, and you're working with uh, Evan on that? Yes. Okay, all right, perfect. All right, and the, did the pop-up work well? What condition was that in? I haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, actually, if you look at the uh, the group posting, you can see it in the background there. It's okay. it's a little rough. It, it was fine. It's, there's no, no holes in it or anything like that, but it worked, yeah. Okay, all right, good. Yeah. The newer, newer one's going to be a little, I'm hoping it'll be a wider uh, apron on the bottom to go ahead and get more information onto it. Okay, good. Yep. All right, good. Moving forward in that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have the data. Uh, we, we have uh, a um, um, Rio on the Elementary, uh, October 28th, 6 to 8 p.m. That's in Arcadia. That's a very nice place. Okay. We've been there, many We've times. Been there before. We've been there oh, before. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. All well, right. You know, this Saturday, is lecture night at Mount Wilson. And as usual, we want uh, the volunteer telescope set up outside the 100 inch and the 60 inch. And of course, it's also open house day, which means no regular tours. You can just wander into wherever you want to go, except Char, it's all mm -hmm. locked up with armed guards, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but otherwise, uh, 60 inch, the 100 inch all that stuff, we'll, you just wander in there and somebody will tell you what's going on. Are they going to have the bottom floor open, Tim, with the old equipment? Um, probably. I think they were looking for people to go in there. I might go in there. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Dan keeps changing his mind. So I got, when I get there, I'll find out what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, so even if you've been to Mount Wilson before, during the open house, they usually open the bottom, and you get, you get to see all the old equipment they used to use. Mm. Oh. And Curtis has an announcement about Ford Observatory for this weekend. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, last, in fact, last uh, on October first, we had a public star party up at uh, up at Mountain High's North Lodge Resort. We had probably around we estimate between three or four hundred people show up for that particular star party. So we deem that a success, and we will probably plan to do it again next year. Okay, this weekend, uh, Joe and I will be set, we'll be at least opening up Ford. We only have three hours before the sun, before the moon comes up. So we don't have a lot of time at Ford this weekend, but Joe and I will plan to open Ford up 
And uh, Joe, if I can have you go ahead and put uh, an announcement on Groups IO, then we'll open it up. We're not sure if we're going to have a, a lot of uh, things to look at because the moon comes up fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. But we will be opening for it on the 22nd of October for basically a half a night star party uh, on that particular Saturday night because the moon, I think, rises about three o'clock in the morning on the uh, 22nd. So we'll plan to do that for four. And when we get into uh, November, we're not sure what we're going to be able to do for four. It is a function of the ski area, uh, whether or not they turn the lights on and they get open early. You never know. We won't know that until we get into uh, November. So that's the plan for Ford on the 22nd of October, the 29th of October, Joe and I will be at nightfall. So we will not have Ford open that weekend. So that's the plan for Ford. Yeah, and we'll have Andy make an announcement with email addresses because if we don't get any responses, we may or may not open Ford. Yeah, that's basically this weekend. We're planning on, I'll send out a, a good announcement for the 22nd on the 22nd of October. So that's the plan right now, okay? I think we're okay, right, Joe? Yep. Okay. I'm All right. Forward. All right, great. Um, I'm dropping the uh, URL into the chat uh, for the, the raffle this evening. So everyone can take a look in the chat. Put your name and uh, email in the form, and uh, later on in the evening, we'll pick a few winners. Uh, All right. Um, if there's no other announcements or anybody needs to do it, yes, great. You're muted. Sorry, I thought you were going to mention just to remind everyone that we have elections coming up, not now, but in the near future. Uh, there's, well, there's a couple of things, actually. Um, I wanted to do, we can do elections, but I think Tim should uh, knows a little bit more about that. And also, can you talk about uh, Polly's uh, honorary lifetime membership? Oh, um, yeah. Some of you might remember Polly Kiner. She's Jean Hansen's wife. <clears throat> Jean was president back in the early 1990s, and he and Polly were constantly up at Lockwood Valley like they lived there, not quite as much as Larry, because nobody's there as much as Larry. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and Polly decided she didn't want to renew her membership just because she rarely goes there and it costs money, et cetera, et cetera. And so the board approved uh, a life membership for her at uh, the last board meeting and that needs to be approved by the members. And so I will make a motion that Polly Kiner be uh, elected by acclamation as a life member of the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. And, and I will second that motion. So all of the members? Anybody? Everybody on mute and all, say all in aye. Favor? Aye. 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 Thumbs up. Aye. Anybody hate Polly? <laughs> okay, good. All right. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll contact her and let her know that uh, she's going to stay a member. Yeah. We got one other thing, Daryl. Uh, okay. Tell them about Science Night. You uh, did. Uh, we mentioned okay. that early, but you missed that part. Again, uh, I think they, maybe you dropped in right after. Um, yeah, Science Night is October 29th at Garvey Ranch Park. Uh, observatory. It's a nice, it's a great place. Um, I won't be there, but Zoli will be on the grill. Zoli's yeah. on the grill. All right. Oh boy. All right. Yeah. Really. And uh, for the elections, um, what we, we have nominations on November. So next month, everybody can say, yes, I'm going to run for some office. Everybody can say, no, I'm not going to run for some office. Everybody can nominate somebody in November and then they can say no and run screaming from the room. Or <laughs> they can say, well, yeah, why not? And, and be sorry for everyone. But, but uh, and then we do the elections probably uh, by uh, one of those uh, web-based polls during the meeting, as I recall, the way Spencer did it last time. 
we do the elections during the meeting. And the December meeting, remember, show and tell. It's we don't have a regular presenter. You, the members, are the presenters of whatever it is you're doing or want to talk about. And so I'll find a speaker for November, but you're on your own for December, literally. <laughs> and people who want to present something should contact who? Spencer, I guess, because he's the one who runs the meeting. Okay. All right. Um, Spencer's not here tonight. He's been having a great time in Iceland looking at the auroras and wonderful other things that he's been sending us photos of. So we miss him, but he's having a great time. Jeff Seidel is asking, is there a place, Jeff Seidel is asking, is there a place where we can see the application or, or uh, the, uh, we can see the open positions? That's what he wants to know. The open positions. Oh, yeah, for running for people that want to the offices, I guess. Uh, well, they're, all, they're all open, I guess. I mean, you can. Every, let them know what's available. Secretary, treasurer, president, vice president, all the board members, annual election for everybody. So if you, I guess our webpage, I think it's the contact page that shows who all the board members and officers are. Just go there and all those officers and, and board members are all up for grabs. Don, did you have a question? Yes. Good evening, everybody. Haven't been around in a while. Got other things I do, I guess. Hey, one question I have is Griffith. Are we going to have any more star parties there this year? We've been having what are called stealth star parties. Griffith doesn't want to advertise anything because they're overwhelmed by the amount of people they get already and they don't want to attract more. So we've been sending a few telescopes maybe a dozen uh, at the request of Mark Pine. And other people have told me they're gonna keep doing this, but I have to wait for Mark Pine to tell me regular star parties that they announce and like 50 people go there or whatever. Uh, I have no idea when they will do that again, if ever. Uh, it's a city run facility and they're absolutely paranoid of everything. So if you look like you might be sick tomorrow. They will escort you off the mountain. With and that uh, also goes for any meetings there anymore. Huh? Yeah, well, meetings. We we meet in the Event Horizon Theater. And when we go back, we need the capability of live streaming those meetings and bringing in remote speakers, which we could not do before. So we have to settle that. And of course, we have to settle the heavy restrictions on getting into the building and they don't have the staff. That's not going to be until next year for sure. Okay. All right. Won't we'll ask until then. <laughs> yeah. We'll let you know. Okay. Okay. But if they if they announce another one of the stealth parties, um, you can get on the list. Um, they've done two of those in the last couple of months, and they were quite successful. So they're they're letting us do limited ones. Uh, you can email someone on the board and we'll make sure you get notified if another one comes up. Before so you. when those come up, does that go out on groups I.O. on the general? It goes out to the outreach list is what we were doing. The outreach list. Okay. okay. So if, if you're interested in those, then get on the outreach list. And that would be contacting Evan, which I think I just saw come in. Yes, Evan? I see you. There, yeah, there, there, is, no, there is hey, no outreach there is. list. There is, there is no outreach list? No, it is, it is the group's I.O. website. Okay. All right. So is it, a, is it one of the sub categories or is it just a general? Just a general. Okay. So if you just get in on groups IO, then you'll know when these things happen. I think almost everything goes through there. Yeah. Cause I found that having a list for this and a list for that. It just didn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Okay. Well, it seems to be working the way it is now. I mean, you, you're, you know, you're pulling for people and you're getting plenty still for all yeah. of the uh, outreaches. Yeah. Okay, good. I would yeah. agree. Yeah, thanks, Evan. I haven't seen it, but I guess I missed it. Is it if I get regular email from LAAS, but I didn't see that one. Well, you might not be attached to our uh, our group email list. Send me an email message, and I'll see what I can do to get you hooked up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, Anybody no link has been. Uh, uh, Gerald, no link has been posted. The, uh, the link has not been posted for the door prizes yet. Uh, in the chat? Correct. Right. That's correct. Well, I, I guess I actually have to 
to press enter for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. There. Oh, okay, it's there now. Thank it's the you. only reason why we show up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank, thank you all for keeping me in line. It's perfect. I love it. Uh, if, <laughs> if there isn't anything else, I would love to have Tim introduce Gail. Uh, one, uh, Daryl, one thing. Are, are we having yes. a... Are we having a star party on the 22nd? Because it's yes. Mount Wilson. We came Wilson in a little late. We are, we are good okay. for the 22nd and the 19th. Okay, so I could and post it on the... Yeah, it's good. Yep. We're, we're okay, going to need volunteers for parking. Yeah, we're going to need volunteers for parking. Um, and it, it's, going to, it's going to be another very busy night because it is being advertised on Instagram as well. So The last one that got, in, that got advertised kind of late-ish, I think, uh, filled the yes. parking lot and had a line out the gate waiting to for people to come in. So I expect it to be the same or more. So we should have a good time. We should have good, everyone had a good time that I talked to. Yep. Definitely. Okay. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I might as well mention uh, we got three loner telescopes out doing the Lord's work. You know, I saw the I saw the spreadsheet tonight and that was fantastic that I saw three out. And then I think somebody, I think there's somebody, a new member that I don't think made it here tonight um, that may show up Wednesday. Yeah. Um, All right. Garvey. Yeah. Um, I know Elizabeth took one of them out and started doing outreach at CSUN. So we've got new, relatively new members out there using the loner scopes for what they're supposed to be used for. Which is good. And the last star party, was there not somebody who like got their loner scope the Wednesday before that Saturday? Same, same, person. <laughs> same person. Same person. First thing she did. She's crushing it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, there's, uh, I have some eyepieces for you. I'll see you on Wednesday. Awesome, great. And also, also thanks to Nate. Also thanks to Nady that uh, and uh, Phil Taylor that they were. We now have another connection with uh, with Pierce College. I understand now doing uh, their their uh, telescope yeah. nights. Okay. Awesome. Well, well, gee, we're busy. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Now, anything else? <laughs> That's it. All right, let's let Tim introduce Gail and let her get going for the night. I bet there's going to be a million questions at the end, so let's get going. Leave her time. Oh, and, boy. And Gail, thank you for coming and doing this tonight. Um, I I hang out at Charter once in a while. I I know both Ollie and, and Norm, who run the, the consoles over there, so to often stop in and say hi. We've got to get Ali to come to Science Night in his Vikings costume. I mentioned it to him again last um, Monday when oh. we, we stopped. We stopped in with a, a small client. We had a very small client, four people. Uh, so we walked over and he let us in. We talked for a minute, and uh, I reminded him that he was supposed to come <laughs> as as Thor on the twenty ninth. Oh, All right. All right. Everyone who's not doesn't need to be. Please mute, and we'll go from there. Well, you all saw Gail's bio on the message that we sent out. She has her PhD in physics and astronomy, as if neither one was enough for her. She had to get a PhD in both, right? Because, And so she's currently the interim director for the Char Array, which is the most fantastic astronomical instrument in the world, uh, the largest optical interferometer around that does great things nothing else can do. And she has a lot of research in adaptive optics and interferometry and high contrast imaging. So she's been all over the place. And I remember when she was the fresh faced new kid on the block, <laughs> Chara, uh, when she came to Mount Wilson. And now she's running everything and is one of their lead scientists. And she's going to tell us all about it. So, Gail, you're on. <laughs> Hi. So can you hear me OK? I can hear you, and you should be able okay. to share your screen. Yeah, I'm going to attempt that now. Oh, boy. Okay, can you see the screen? I okay? see the light. Looks like presenters view. There you go. Yeah. Okay, you can see it there? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, Gail Schaefer, and I'll be giving an overview of the Char Array. So the Char Array is located at Mount Wilson Observatory up in the uh, San Gabriel Mountains. And we combine the light from six one meter telescopes uh, to achieve very high angular resolution. And so we have the resolution that we can actually image the surfaces of other stars besides the sun. Uh, so tonight I'll be giving uh, 
basically a photo tour of the array and then uh, talk about some of the exciting science results that we're currently producing. Okay, so this is an aerial view of Mount Wilson Observatory in the center of the image. Uh, let's see if you can see my mouse is the historic 100 inch dome. You have the 60 uh, inch dome over here and the uh, uh, solar tower towers also. And the chair telescopes are actually smaller one meter telescopes that are hidden uh, amongst the trees here. So we're going to switch to like a cartoon view that kind of outlined in black highlights the chair facilities. Uh, so we have six uh, uh, one meter telescopes that are arranged in a Y configuration here with two telescopes in the south, two in the east and two in the west. <laughs> And so the closest pair of telescopes is separated by 34 meters, and the largest pair of telescopes is separated by 331 meters. And so these black circles just highlight each of the six telescopes in the array. And so basically what we do is we can uh, send the light from each telescope through vacuum pipes into the central L-shaped building, which is our beam combination lab. Uh, and uh, the main objective of the char array is uh, to get very high spatial resolution. Uh, so basically, uh, by combining the light together from these six telescopes, you can simulate the resolution of a 300 meter telescope. Um, and so in comparison, uh, this is just basically just a, a collection of different uh, single dish telescopes. You have on here some familiar telescopes, like the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. And these are all on, in scale on this uh, chart here. You have the two 10-meter Keck telescopes in on uh, Mauna Kea, Hawaii. And then over on the right side, you have the 30-meter the, um, telescopes, which will be the next generation of largest telescopes that are built. And so we can scale this then to the size of the array. And that huge 30-meter telescope is basically fits within our closest pair of telescopes here. Um, so basically, the full array gives you the same, gives you about 10 times the resolution that compared to the next generation of 30 meter telescopes. Um, the downside is that we don't have the light collecting area of the uh, 300 meter telescope, but we do have the resolution of one. So the equivalent uh, size scale that we're uh, able to resolve would be. Um, the equivalent size of a person standing on the moon is the kind of the level of detail that we, we are able to see. Of course, the, the moon is too big for us to look at. <laughs> okay, so uh, the CHAR array was built and is operated by Georgia State University. And so CHAR itself, the acronym, stands for the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy. Um, and the center itself is located at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, but they selected Mount Wilson as an ideal site to build this array of one meter telescopes. So uh, groundbreaking for the array occurred in 1996 with uh, first in uh, light or first fringes in 1999 and routine science operations since 2005. And uh, the array has been very productive since then with over uh, 200 refereed publications. And uh, we, we couldn't do this all on our own. So we have a, a large consortium of uh, uh, collaborators who uh, provide instrumentation and expertise for the CHAR array. And this is just some of the institutions involved. The, uh, in addition to Georgia State University, there's the University of Michigan, University of Exeter, uh, two facilities in France, one in Paris, one in Nice, and uh, Sydney University in Australia and the Australian National University. And we also have some collaborators at Kyoto University. And then a new addition to this uh, uh, process is that we now have community access time where people um, in, the, in the astronomical community across, uh, across the US and around the world can apply for open access time through NOIR Lab, which is the National Optical and Infrared uh, Research Laboratory. So basically how the array works is that for any uh, pair of telescopes, uh, you combine the light together and instead of uh, getting a direct image of the star, you actually uh, interfere the light and record an interference pattern between the two, uh, between the pair of telescopes. And so uh, basically to get this interference pattern, the, the light from each telescope has to travel the exact same distance 
uh, from one telescope to the other, um, and be uh, the same distance within a fraction of a wavelength. Um, and because the, uh, you know, depending on where you're pointing in the sky, the light from uh, will hit one telescope before it hits the other. And so you have this path length difference uh, in the uh, uh, distance that uh, the star reaches the telescopes. So then uh, to correct for this, we send the light into a laboratory and add some path difference uh, that equalizes the, the path, total path that the star light travels and you get out your interference fringes. And now in, in the case of a, a single telescope, your um, resolution of a telescope is dependent on the diameter of the telescope. So the builder, bigger you build the telescope, the uh, higher resolution. And in the case of um, an array or an interferometer like this, you, your resolution is set by the distance between the telescopes. So you can have much smaller aperture telescopes, and, uh, but separated by a large distance to give you high resolution. And so now I'll just give you a quick photo tour of the array. So this is one of our six meter telescopes in uh, the array. And each telescope has an adaptive optics system in it. So in the red circle here uh, highlights where the deformable mirror is in the adaptive optics system. So this bench is just connected to the side of the telescope. And so the, the light comes in and is, uh, uh, is collected by the primary mirror, sent up to the secondary tertiary and into the adaptive optics system on the side. And the deformable mirror, basically it, the shape can change to correct for the atmospheric distortions uh, uh, of the starlight. And then from the adaptive optics system, it's sent down through here and back into the telescope and down uh, out through the bottom. And here you can see one of these uh, uh, vacuum pipes that connects the telescope uh, into the laboratory. And so here from the telescope, uh, the light travels through these uh, um, vacuum pipes and you can see the uh, pair of telescopes from the southern arm of the array going across the mountaintop. Um, and from there, uh, it gets sent to the laboratory. So this, uh, this view here that was taken from the uh, catwalk of the 100 inch dome, you can see the three arms of the interferometer entering our central uh, beam combining lab. And the, the beam combining lab itself is a building within a building. Um, and basically, so that we can keep thermal stability in the inner lab here. So this is just the wall and the doorway into the inner lab. Um, and here we basically have all the light pipes entering the building and they go through these final uh, turning boxes which have mirrors basically to make all the uh, six different paths of light parallel going in, into the, the inner part of the lab there. Um, and all of our uh, computers to run the equipment inside the array is located in this um, outer control room here. And so this is uh, uh, the, the first stop inside the lab are these uh, delay lines. And basically these uh, delay lines have little carts that travel on them. And this is basically where our uh, path length that the star travel, the light starlight travels gets equalized. And so basically these carts uh, track the star across the sky and slowly move along these rails during the night to basically equalize the path length so that we can record our interference fringes. And from those de uh, uh, delay lines, you, uh, we come into these uh, beam reducer tables um, and through, uh, this is just the opposite side showing the, the beam reducers and they, they go through a beam splitter that separates out the uh, visible light from the near infrared light. And before it gets to here, it passes a second adaptive optic system that's in the lab. And so here we have a small uh, a deformable mirror. And basically this is just correcting for any uh, slow distortions of the light uh, between the telescope and uh, when it enters the lab. <laughs> and then after the adaptive optic, optic system, you have this final uh, uh, beam splitter here, as I, I mentioned, that separates out the visible light and the infrared light, and it sends it to uh, around the corner to the beam combining lab. <laughs> and so each of these tables in this beam combining lab is a different instrument. Um, and so each of these instruments is what actually does the magic of combining the, uh, the light from each of the different telescopes together to form your interference fringes. 
And so there's a camera on each one of these tables uh, that will record the interference fringes. And um, each table has kind of a different specialty. So you, you get to choose which instrument you're gonna use on a different night. And um, uh, basically uh, we have three instruments that combine all six telescopes together. And so each, each pair of telescope basically gives you a one dimensional uh, slice through the star of what that star looks like. Um, so the more pairs of telescopes you can uh, combine together, you can kind of piece together what the uh, surfaces of the star looks like. And then as the earth rotates, you kind of fill in that coverage at, as the um, uh, direction that the uh, pair of baseline samples on the sky rotates. And so we have three uh, uh, instruments that combine all six telescopes. And so these are our main imaging instruments that uh, image the surfaces of stars. And they, uh, the three instruments operate at different wavelength regions, one in the visible, one in the near infrared H band, and one in the near infrared K band. And then we have two uh, uh, additional in instruments that combine fewer telescopes, only two or three telescopes at a time, but they have higher sensitivity. So we use those instruments to uh, look at fainter stars in the sky. Oh, and this is just uh, basically a little video showing uh, uh, an overview of the array. So this is one of our telescopes here. You see the uh, mirror opening down there. And this is the adaptive optics bench on the side of the telescope. And it follow, basically following the path of light down through the optical table and out through the final mirror. And this is, these are the light pipes feeding into the lab. And this is very quickly walking in the outer region, the outer corridor of our lab building. And here's all the computers that control the carts in the lab and the instruments uh, and detectors in the lab. And then this is inside the lab. Those are the beam reducer tables. And we have the delay, long delay lines here. And here are the carts moving very quickly, doing a little dance. <laughs> And this is our switch yard where we can send the light from each telescope to a specific uh, science instrument over around the corner. And these are the beam combiners that record the interference fringes. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, instead of getting direct images of the stars, what we measure are interference fringes. Um, and basically uh, the fringes that you measure will depend on what kind of star you're looking at. So if you have a very small star that's unresolved, basically all the fringes that you record from the star will line up um, and give you this very high contrast fringe pattern that you see on the top here. Um, if you have a larger star, basically the fringes uh, from one side versus the other side will be a little displaced from each other. Uh, so they'll basically, the fringe pattern uh, will be a little blurred out so you get um, lower contrast fringes for a star that's large. <laughs> and so basically by measuring the amplitude of these fringe patterns, it's a way to determine the size of the star that you're looking at. And that's the main science objective of the array is to measure the sizes um, and get images of what we're looking at. <laughs> so this is a Hertzsprung russell diagram of uh, about 300 stars that have their diameters measured through interferometry. And so at the uh, Chara array, we can measure the uh, size of, the, of stars all along the main sequence from massive O and B type stars to cool low mass M type stars. And so basically the, the sizes of the symbols here correspond, uh, are, are related to the size of the stars that we measure. Uh, and in, in addition to the main sequence, you can see how the size of the stars changes uh, when the star evolves off the main sequence up into the giant branch. Um, and see so the giant stars are of course uh, much bigger. <laughs> and one particular area of interest uh, for researchers at the Char Array is to try to measure the sizes of um, stars that have exoplanets around them. 
And so basically, if you have the radius of a, the star, uh, you can refine your estimates of the uh, uh, effective temperature of a star and their energy output. And so basically, you can set stricter limits on the size of the habitable zones around the stars and determine whether the planets that are detected through other means are inside the habitable zone or not. And there's also another trick that you can play if a star has been uh, detected as a transiting, uh, if a planet has been detected as a transiting exoplanet uh, through like space missions like uh, Kepler and TESS, where you actually see, uh, measure the starlight and see a little dip in the starlight as the planet passes uh, in front of the, the star surface. Uh, so so the, uh, if, you, if you have a, uh, a star that has an, a transiting exoplanet and you measure the size, you can then compare the size of the star with the uh, timing of the light curve to get it to infer what the radius of the transiting planet is also. And you can also look at stars that are pulsating. So this is uh, some uh, chara observations that were done on a Cepheid variable star with the outer layers um, periodically expand and contract. And so this uh, bottom plot on the left shows the uh, changes in the angular diameter that we measured of the star of Delta Cepheid. And uh, if you combine the changes in the angular size that we measure with the, uh, um, uh, the radial velocities, uh, you can actually, uh, it's a way that you can measure uh, distances to Cepheid stars and calibrate the cosmic distance scale uh, for Cepheid variable stars. In addition to measuring the size of the stars, if the star has a large enough angular size, you can actually uh, reconstruct what the image, uh, reconstruct what this surface looks like of the star too. So this is a collection of rapidly rotating stars that were um, observed with the Char array. So if you have a star that rotates rapidly, it's gonna be uh, bulged at the equator and flattened at the poles. And so in addition to the size difference between the uh, equator and the pole, you can actually uh, use Chara to measure differences in the brightness across the surface of the star. And so each of these images, there'll be two effects that you see here. One is that as you get, uh, as you go from the pole closer to the limb of the star, uh, the, uh, the limbs will appear darker. So an effect called limb darkening. And in, in addition, because the, um, uh, the poles are closer, <laughs> to the uh, core of the star, no, they'll, appear no, hotter. No. they'll appear hotter than the um, equator, which is further from the uh, core of the star. So you can actually measure that temperature difference that here the uh, equators will uh, appear darker than the bright poles. And there's an effect called gravity darkening. So you can start uh, studying uh, um, basically uh, stellar structure uh, by getting these surface images of the stars. And you can also see uh, uh, more detail for magnetically active stars. You can start resolving star spots on the surface of the, of the stars. So these are three different stars. In the top row, uh, we have two movies showing, one showing the magnetically active star Zeta Andromeda and another Sigma, uh, Sigma Gem. And uh, if you watch the movies, you can see sparse star spots going in and out of the field of view. And finally, on the on the far right is Lambda Andromeda, uh, with two big spots on it. And so, uh, basically, these these uh, stars with, that have the movies of them were basically follow through their full rotation cycles. Um, so you can uh, kind of get a sense of uh, the motion of stars on the surface, how many spots there are, whether they're symmet symmetric. Uh, in northern and southern latitudes on the on the surface, and the bottom row basically is just a uh, unrolling the whole surface of the star, so you can see where the spots are are located um, in a full view of the star. In addition to star spots, you can actually uh, look at uh, convection in supergiant stars. Uh, so this is a supergiant star, AZ Sig. Um, and the uh, left is an image reconstructed from the Char array. And uh, th this was a project where um, I actually 
uh, observe the star over from uh, year to year. And you can actually see uh, across different years that the large scale structure stays fairly uh, consistent from year to year, but the small scale structure changes from month to month. <laughs> And uh, the image on the right is basically a model simulation of what the surface of a supergiant might look like. So uh, now we can kind of match up your uh, theory with actual observations of what we're seeing. And in, just, in addition to looking at single stars, uh, the chart array is very uh, efficient at looking at close binary systems. And so this is just an example of uh, the star Sigma Orionis, so it's an O, o star multiple system in the constellation of Orion. And Sigma Orionis is actually a, um, a, a multiple system of several O type stars. Um, and the closest pair in this zoomed in version here is A, B. Um, and A and B can be uh, resolved with um, uh, adaptive optics or speckle imaging. And they a star, the primary star itself, is a spectroscopic binary uh, with a period of 143 days. And at Char Array, we were able to spatially resolve that orbit uh, with a, a sub angular separation of only four milli arc seconds. Um, and uh, one of the advantages here is if you can um, spatially resolve the orbit and combine that with your spectroscopic orbit, it's a way to get the masses of the stars in the system. <laughs> And you can also, also look at closer in binary systems uh, and study mass transfer in interacting binaries. So this, um, uh, this uh, on, the, on the left is an artist's conception of mass transfer in uh, an interacting binary, where you have an evolved star that diameter gets larger. And if it, uh, the binary companion is close enough, it'll start pulling uh, material off of the evolved star and form an accretion disk that uh, forms around the uh, companion star. And so this little movie on the right is actual uh, data that was taken with the Char array. And in addition to mapping out the orbit of these two stars, you can uh, also see the tidal distortion in the evolved star and kind of a thick disk shape around the mass, the, the star that's gaining the mass in the system. And this, uh, this binary has a period of only 13 days. And another interesting binary that the Char Array looked at is this, uh, an eclipsing binary uh, named Epsilon Array G. And so Epsilon Array G uh, uh, goes through an eclipse every 27 years. And it goes through a very long eclipse that lasts about a year and a half. Um, and it has a very flat bottom in the eclipse. And so it was theorized that this, um, that the, the, uh, the star itself is eclipsed by a companion, a companion star that's hidden in this thick disk of material. And that thick disk of material will go through, pass across the surface of the star. And so the last eclipse of Epsilon Array J happened in 2009, and we were lucky enough to look at it with the Char Array. And so uh, these images on, on the uh, left-hand side, you see a pre-eclipse image from 2008. And as, as the eclipse started, you see the, uh, this Pac-Man shape of the uh, bottom half of the star being eclipsed by this thick disk of material that's passing through. And then all the way at the bottom, uh, basically if you combine all the images that the chart array took, you can kind of reconstruct the, the structure of what that thick disk of material looks like around that hidden companion star. And, uh, so that's the silhouette of the, uh, the disk on the bottom. So you can actually start to study uh, that, that disk material uh, that, that's around the companion star. You can actually measure, uh, uh, start observing uh, direct images of disks also. And so uh, one uh, popular target for the Char Array is to look at uh, disks around BE stars. And so uh, BE stars are B-type stars, so massive stars that have strong emission lines. Um, and basically, they are uh, rapidly rotating, and they're rotating so fast that they're throwing material off the surface of the star into this outflowing disk of material. And this on the, the left is an artist's conception of the uh, star. And this on the, the right is a model of the uh, uh, um, a nearby binary BE star called Gamma Cass. 
And here you can start studying the structure of the disk around the star. Um, and it, these uh, uh, long-standing questions about how BE stars gain their rapid rotation. And one idea is that they're the remnants of a past mass transfer event where you had an evolved star that lost its material that uh, fell onto the, the BE star and spun it up. Um, and so the chart array is also useful for finding these uh, faint companions that are the remnants from a past mass transfer event. So here you, you see the BE star phi per, and uh, in, you see in the center of the image, the disk around the star, and then around it, you have this orbit of this faint companion that's going around the star. And this faint companion only get, contributes 1.5% of the light in the near infrared H-band. Um, but the, the measurements with the char array are very sensitive to detecting these close in faint companions. And you could also look at disks around young stars. So protoplanetary disks that are in the process of forming stars. Uh, and so this is a, a young star called Fe Orionis. Um, with adaptive optics imaging, you can kind of get the large scale structure of the uh, outer disk here. And then with the char array, you can zoom in at what the structure of the inner disk looks like. And these are just some results from uh, different stars. Here you see uh, an inclined disk around the star Suriji. And then we have a very exciting result that's coming out now on the young star system V1925 Aquila, which you actually see this ring of material with what looks like maybe the bright stop, spot forming in that disk. So very exciting results of uh, asymmetries developing in these young star disks. This is another uh, young uh, star system, GW Orionis. So it's actually a triple star system. And so it's a triple star system and it has uh, uh, circumstellar, uh, circum triple disks around it. So you have, uh, if you look at a wide scale, field of view. So this was uh, the sphere adaptive optics system on the very large telescope. Uh, you, you can look at the uh, outer regions of the circumstellar disk and that's it's also overplotted with an ALMA image of a disk. This is zoomed in here on the ALMA image of the inner rim. Um, and very small inside you have a triple system. And when you look at the the disk itself, you know the the um, uh, the researchers found that this disk is warped and the inner rings, the inner disk is tilted with respect to the outer disk. And using uh, the Chara array to map the orbits of the inner triple system, they were able to uh, uh, simulate that the, uh, the, the motion in this triple system is basically tearing apart the outer disk of the system. <laughs> And you can also, uh, uh, Char Array has also been look, uh, used to look at uh, nova explosions. So uh, in the case of a classical nova, you have a white dwarf that uh, is in a binary system. And uh, uh, nova happens when a material from the binary companion starts accreting onto the white dwarf. And once the pressure builds uh, to a certain, certain level, the uh, nova explodes in a thermonuclear explosion and material expands out from the nova. It gets very bright and expands out. Um, and so you can actually measure the size of nova explosions at the very early days after uh, a nova outburst occurs. Uh, so this was uh, results on, the, uh, uh, on a nova called uh, Nova Del in 2013. Uh, and it, the nova itself was uh, uh, discovered by an amateur astronomer in Japan. And a day after the discovery, we were able to point the telescopes of the Shire Array to the NOVA and actually measure that we were able to resolve the size. And we basically followed it for 40 days and basically measured the size each day. And you see, it's, you see this uh, angular expansion of the size versus time in this plot on the, on the left. And then three early epochs of the, uh, this outburst, uh, we were able to um, get image reconstructions of what the NOVA looks like. And most of the other observations in, the, in this plot were just one-dimensional one measurements of the size of the expansion. 
Uh, but these images allow you to look at the structure of the array of the of the nova in the earliest days after the uh, nova occurs, and see how asymmetries that you can see much later um, through observations through adaptive optics and Hubble Space Telescope, and you um, they can see much wider scale, uh, like. Uh, um, many hundred days and years after the expansion. And here you can see just uh, a few days after the expansion. Uh, more recently, uh, in June of 2021, uh, uh, the Char Array was also used to observe uh, a nova in uh, the Her Hercules constellation. And so the, basically this was uh, observed on uh, two days after the outburst and three days after the outburst. And you see that what looks like an expansion and the formation of um, possibly a, a ring or a bipolar outflow that's forming around the star at very early times. And then uh, uh, one of the uh, most recent results that is coming out of the array is looking at uh, extragalactic sources. So um, the, the char array, because we only have six, uh, we only have one meter telescopes and are sending the light across the uh, mountain. We're very limited in terms of brightness of what we can see. But the centers of uh, massive galaxies, um, uh, there's a supermassive black hole in the center of massive galaxies, and they can be uh, very luminous sources uh, because of an accretion disk that forms around them and uh, dumps material onto the supermassive black hole. And so this is basically a, a model conception of what these uh, supermassive black holes look like at the center of actic galactic nuclei, where you have an accretion disk in the center, uh, a dusty torus surrounding it, and sometimes these jets of material that are, are coming out. And depending on what angle you're looking at this, you can observe different properties of the active galactic nuclei. Now, the size of this dust torus that forms around the active galactic nucleus uh, is very small. And so uh, one thing that you can look at with the uh, with interferometry is how, uh, whether you can actually resolve that torus region. And so um, the uh, char array was used to observe the, uh, the active galactic nuclei in uh, the galaxy NGC 4151. Um, and in the HST image here, you can uh, uh, generate the, the direction of this jet emanating from uh, the, the uh, core of the nucleus. And then uh, with the char array, we we're able to resolve the dust-like structure. And we see that the uh, uh, thermal emission from the dust ring is aligned in a perpendicular direction to the jet. And so this basically allows us to test those theories of energy generation in active galactic nuclei. And then I figured I'd end by saying a little bit about the future of the array. Um, and so uh, currently we have six one meter telescopes. So we're in the, currently in the process of adding a, um, an additional one meter telescope to the array. Um, that's gonna be a mobile telescope that we can move to different locations. Um, and so the, the telescope itself is, a, is going to be a one meter plane wave telescope. Um, and the uh, order for the telescope has been pla placed. And then we're going to um, set the telescope on a movable trailer that we can move around the mountaintop. Um, and so in the uh, topo map on the right, uh, the white lines basically in the, the Y shape mark the current arms of the interferometer. And so there's gonna be several locations that we uh, can potentially move this new telescope to. Um, one is this, uh, the blue square on the topo map, which is right very close to our S1, S2 telescope. So that's the shortest baseline in the array. And so basically this gives a very small triangle um, that could be useful for imaging very big stars. And uh, uh, like big supergiant stars like uh, Betelgeuse. Um, and so one thing with having very large baselines at Chara is actually hard to image the largest stars in the sky. Um, so you're very over-resolved. And so any emission that you detect in the fringes is very, very small amplitude fringes. So it's hard to detect those long baseline fringes. So this small triangle of telescopes that we're adding will allow us to image very large stars. 
And then the next objective is to uh, move the star telescope to further locations marked by these uh, red squares here um, that will give us very long baselines. And so our current longest baseline is 300 meters. And so we have a site that can extend it out to 550 meters in the south. And then our ultimate goal is to go to one kilometer baselines um, uh, and basically have the resolution to do uh, resolve even smaller stars in the sky. Um, one of the main science objectives of this is to maybe for these transiting exoplanets is to have the sensitivity to actually resolve one of these small exo exoplanets transiting the surface of a star, which would be really cool to see for the first time. Um, so one novel thing about this mobile telescope is that instead of um, connecting the telescopes to the beam combining lab through the vacuum pipes, um, the idea here is that we're going to experiment with using optical uh, fiber optics to connect the telescope um, into the lab. So we'll have uh, fibers running across the mountaintop instead of the light pipes. And so the benefit of these optical fibers is that you can go to a variety of different locations. So you're not bound just by having a line of sight between your telescope and your beam combining lab to send a, a vacuum pipe so that you can uh, uh, put it at more places on the mountain. So it uh, should be an exciting uh, development in the array and um, potentially with even high resolution, higher resolution on the horizon. <laughs> And uh, that basically finishes up my talk. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Uh, some of it went over my head, but I expected that. Uh, I, I thought I thought it was really great. I you know I see Chara a lot. I'm up at Mount Wilson a lot, so I see all that stuff, and it's it's fascinating to get a much more in depth understanding of what you're looking at. Um, it's it's not very apparent, um, I think, up there what it is that you're looking at. Some of the results. So uh, loved it. I do have a question. Um, I noticed on the on the big illustration of all of the telescope sizes that you had one that was missing that I didn't see. It was a very important telescope to me, and that's the 60 inch telescope at Mount Wilson. You have the 100. <laughs> okay, yes, yes. It's a 60, 60 inch, I mean, just come on, the 100 is an upscaled 60. So yes, that yes. should be on that illustration. Next time I want to see it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and I, I can't take credit for making that illustration, but I will try to track down who has made it. And have them I'm, sure it was, I'm sure it wasn't your illustration, but I did notice that. <laughs> question, open to questions. I have, I have a question for you, uh, Gail. Uh, how many stars uh, do you track in one night? I mean, there's so many. It's like, uh, who's, uh, are, are the professors at the different colleges the ones that select? Which what they want to look at is my understanding or wow yeah it's like, so, this so is we like have all, all time at Chara is uh, through uh, a competitive call for pr proposals so uh, twice a year we um, put out a call for proposals and we have kind of two different avenues where you can apply for time one is to be part of the institutions that are part of the Chara array and the other is just through this. Um, the War Lab, which is uh, the National Optical Infrared Research Laboratory that offers time uh, across the US and across the world. Uh, so basically, uh, any researcher who's interested in using Chara will write up a proposal of the science they want to do and which stars they want to look at, um, and what they want to accomplish with it, and how many nights they need. Um, and then uh, 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 time allocation committee gets together and basically reads the proposals and uh, grades them and the proposals at the top get the time. So every night uh, we basically observe from <laughs> March through the end of December. So every night is assigned to a particular uh, scientist and the number of nights depends on uh, the number of nights they need to do the science. So uh, typically in a given night, it depends on like for programs that you're doing these um, surface imaging, you might spend the whole night on one star, but if you're just doing diameter measurements, you might hop around to, you know, five to 10 different stars during the night. Wow. 
I have a question. I know, I know the adaptive optics are fairly new. How much of a difference does that make? Oh yeah, it 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 makes um yeah, it makes it, we we gain about a magnitude of sensitivity. Um, uh, but the main one of the main advantages is that um, on any given night we get more light concentrated into the science instruments. So it basically just improves our efficiency. So it takes um, oh. like medium seeing nights and turns them into good seeing nights. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah. So we get, um, uh, it, yeah, it definitely makes a, a, um, a big difference in terms of the ejection of light into the science detectors. <laughs> it's fully installed now on all the scopes? Yeah, it is. Uh, so the, ins so we have two sets of adaptive optics system on every telescope. So uh, in, inside the laboratory, all six are installed. Um, and at the telescope, five out of, out of six installed. So we have one uh, remaining deformal mirror that needs to be ins installed. It was uh, broken in shipping. So it, um, we had to send it back to the manufacturer and they um, replaced the deformable membrane. And it's, uh, it's uh, currently being calibrated. So yeah, hopefully nice. within the next... Yeah, by the end of the year, hopefully we have it on all six. <laughs> but yeah, you definitely see an improvement in the amount of light you get from the five telescopes that have adaptive optics. The amount of usable stuff. Yeah. Don, you got Thanks. a question? Yes, I don't want to be funny, but I hope all those cables that I saw are tagged. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have... Um, made an investment in a label maker. So yes. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask you about how you were going to transmit the light, but you you jumped right in and said it's going to be fiber optics, which is what I thought. Yeah, is, it going to be, yes. is it going to be large scale fiber optic or are they still good? Because right now I think the the beam coming through the pipes is like, like six inches or? It, yeah, it's like, uh, tw yeah, 12 centimeters. So. 12 centimeters, okay. Yeah. 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 So, so is, is there going to be like one really large fiber optic? So it will take the whole thing? Yeah. So we'll, we'll use like a standard like communication optical fiber. So we'll focus the light into the fiber. Uh, okay. uh, so we'll have an, at, on the telescope, we'll have an injection system that focuses okay. the light into the fiber. Okay. So you're going to so. use a database kind of a system to send the optical signal the same way we would with data over fiber optic, where you amplify it on the way in and it goes across. The, the, the question I had about that is you're talking about having the that mobile unit, say a kilometer away. Are you literally going to roll over ground cable out over the ground, out to where it is? I mean, obviously you're not trenching it or it would be permanent. Yeah, okay, so so yeah, so the, Okay, so, so I'll start with the, the the first part. So when you inject the light into the fiber, we take it into the lab. You, you still have to add the delay. So once it gets into the lab, it comes out of the optical fiber and goes through the regular light path into the uh, science instruments in the lab. Um, and so then for each location, we're, we are actually planning to trench them. And so uh, for each station that we build, it'll have a dedicated fiber to it. So we'll have um, we'll have to buy a new fiber for each station that we commission. Okay, so it's mobile, but it's not really. It's... Yeah, it's, it's mobile that you can move the telescope from site okay. to site, but it's yeah, you still have to do some planning of where you're putting it because <laughs> the, the sites will be more or less permanent, just not used all the time. <laughs> that makes more sense. Okay, <laughs> uh, Dr. Schaefer, the. The, the, the current scopes are all deployed in pairs. So the mobile, is that going to also be a, a pair of, of one meter mirrors, or is that going to be just a single unit? You do you not need a pair to extend the baseline from the other array, from the rest of the array. Yeah, so, so we can combine, the, the, with the existing telescopes, we combine either, um, you know, the, the minimum is that we combine is two, but we can combine, combine all six at once. And so with the mobile telescopes, we'll be combining them with the existing telescopes. So for that, the existing telescopes also have to have these fiber optics that lead into the, the telescope. So, so the, the new telescope is being designed so that it, 
the output basically matches our existing telescope so that we can combine mm -hmm. the mobile telescopes with the six existing telescopes. Okay. Well, in any combination of six. <laughs> so, so does that mean that you would actually be using a co total of eight uh, mirror or scopes at the same time, or would you just be turning off two of the others and always be dealing with six? Yeah. So right now the, we don't have any uh, immediate plans to. Um, expand our instruments to combine more than six. So right now you, you get to select which six you want to use, or we will be able to choose which six we want to use. So depending on what science you want to accomplish and what resolution you need. So you're not actually increasing uh, resolution by adding the other two, you're just modifying uh, dimensionality of it. So yeah, and the resolution is set by the distance between the two telescopes. So by going to a site that's farther away, it increases the resolution. <laughs> um, doesn't change the light collecting area or anything. <laughs> um, I was kind of wondering about uh, how those delay lines actually work. How do you delay light in a way that's meaningful? Yeah, so, so the, basically the uh, carts are, just have mirrors on them with a, um, so they reflect off a cat's eye and it goes out the other side. And so they're just moving to physically change, you know, as the light comes in, bounces off, it, the cart's just moving. So it, it changes the physical length. So it works out like changing the length of the pipe itself, sort of? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. cool, cool, cool. Okay. It's a very, it's a very, very long room. Yeah, yeah. This um, those delay lines are like forty five meters mm -hmm. long. So and you have twice, and so you have twice that to deal with, right? So you can bounce yeah, all the way yeah. to the end and back. Yeah, and we have a, a laser metrology system that um, during the night constantly record monitors the location of the carts. So we um, we had a we have a predicted location of where they should be, and if everything works out well, we have the fringes. <laughs> Cool. Somebody just to... asked if the uh, if the drawing is still open. Yes, I just posted the drawing form again. So let's get those all in and then uh, the questions. We, we still have time for questions. Are you good with questions, Gail? You have time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. We'll continue yeah. with questions then. I noticed that Morgan and Stan have had their little hand icon up for quite a while. So we ought to let them <laughs> butt in you. and ask their questions. Right on. Um, so I was going to ask... Um, you had indicated that, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, we have a, a, another visit, listener. I'm uh, sorry, but that's, you just got upstage. It's fantastic. That's good. <laughs> um, well, the first thing was there was the question about how that data was getting transmitted. It was analog over the fiber or digital. I, it was asked a little bit differently than that, but um, I guess that's still an open question. It sounded like you'd implied that. I don't know whether I'm assuming digital and then you had said that all the others are going to get switched over to do the same. So are you abandoning the vacuum tubes? No. So we're not abandoning the, the vacuum tubes altogether because they still. Um, yeah. So so uh, basically uh, we're still going to use the vacuum tubes because when you put the light into the fiber, um, probably not as much will get transmitted through the fiber as you do just through open air in the vacuum tube or yeah so um so if you're not if you don't have any reason to use one of these new sites you can still use the array as is right but if you want to use one of the new sites you have to then use fiber optics on all the telescopes that you want to combine together um, and so, yeah, we're not converting it to a digital signal. It's just light going through the fiber and coming out the other side of the fiber as light still. So you'll put a, you'll put a switch in, in each of the telescopes to switch from the light pipe to the fiber? Yeah, it, it probably will. Yeah, yeah, that there'll, there'll be a fiber running that's trenched to each telescope and goes in and there'll be some module that goes in and then okay. instead of going... Uh, out into the light pipes gets injected I, into the. I believe you said there was four instrument tables at, at the final destination where you can actually collect the data. Um, just prior to that, there was the splitting of uh, visible to and near infrared. So I'm guessing you have instruments 
for either visible or near infrared on those yeah. quantities. And and that's yeah, and that, nothing outside of those two options, probably. Yeah, yeah. So right now it's the the visible and the near infrared. And so going to the um the the resolution of the ray is is dependent on um the separation of the telescopes, but it's also dependent on the wavelength that you look at. So when you go to the shorter visible wavelengths, you get even higher resolution. So um, the smallest stars are usually um, resolved in the visible. Awesome. And the, the near infrared is uh, very useful for uh, looking at uh, gas and dust and circumstellar disks that emit in the near infrared. <laughs> Thanks for trying to get all that information to us that was that was fantastic so if, if uh, go ahead don and also I stand. Wondering, uh, where is the design of all this done is it here in the california or or georgia state or it's all yeah over? so the original uh design for the charter array was um, uh, initiated by Hal McAllister, who is a faculty member and director of uh, the Center for High Angular Resolution in Atlanta, Georgia. And so when it came down to, when they got funding to build the array, they uh, looked around for sites and they were considering uh, Mount Wilson and a few sites in uh, New Mexico also. And um, yeah, for a variety of re reasons, Mount Wilson won out and we're here. So yeah, so the, all the chair staff is actually employees of uh, Georgia State University. Uh, so we have a, a staff of um, about uh, 17 people who work out on the mountain and uh, two array operators who are up all night and a lot of support staff during the day that keeps everything running in the lab aligned. Um, and then in addition to that, each of the instruments in the lab were um, designed and built by our different collaborating institutions, so. Okay, thank you. Hey, so you guys so are all from the university? Richard, Richard, Richard. Yeah. We got a couple of people waiting for questions. Sorry. Stan, you jump in here, you've been waiting uh, for a while. Yes, uh, I was just curious, and this may be like asking someone to pick a favorite child, but what's the most surprising result to come out of Chara in your opinion? Yeah, so I think, let me see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the things that was, I mean, I guess in a way it was expected, but it was the kind of like the most shocking thing to see in terms of like just being awestruck was the um, those images of uh, epsilon origi with the that was the. Uh, um, the eclipsing binary that's eclipsed by that disk of material. Huh. So we had a large group of people on the mountain during those observations. And um, so we collected the data at night and our collaborator at the University of Michigan, John Monnier, um, uh, was back in Michigan and decided to reduce the data during the day. And so when we woke up after uh, sleeping during the day, we saw this image of this <laughs> like, section cut out of the star. It was pretty, pretty amazing to actually see that. So. Robert? You, you're muted. No, not yet. Yeah, this one might work a little bit. There you go. Uh, uh, no, with a uh, one kilometer of, of fiber, that seems to me like that would make the light 500 meters too slow to get to the compared to the vacuum tubes. Do you have to beef up the delay lines on everything else uh, since the fiber is going to be so slow? Yeah. So, so the um, yeah. So when we use the uh, uh, the station at one kilometer, we'll also have. Um, fibers of the same length from each of the other telescopes, even though we don't need that length of fiber. So they'll all go through the, um, the constant. So the initial stage, uh, we'll, we're gonna start with fiber length of about 600 meters. Uh, so it won't actually get us out to the one kilometer site. So we'll have to splice two fibers together eventually. Um, but initially each telescope will have 600 meters of fiber. So they'll be the same path length through the fibers from each telescope. So the, the 
Telescopes that are very close to the lab will just have a spool of fibers sitting somewhere near the lab that just <laughs> goes around just to add the same amount of delay. So good question. So what, once they get back into the lab, they still go into the delay lines? Yeah, yeah, because the, the fibers will be this like a fixed length for each telescope, but you still right. have to correct the, just the geometric okay. effects of right, right. being at different locations. Um, so if you have one more telescope, is there a, is there a seventh <laughs> cart? No, there isn't a seventh cart. So again, we'll be using, uh, we'll be using one of the carts from Got it. the existing okay. telescopes. So there's Got actually it. room in the laboratory to add a seventh delay line. So that, could be a future expansion that we build a, a seventh okay. one and that would maybe motivate us to build a combiner that combines all seven. <laughs> okay, Chris? Yes, oh, hey, thank you. Um, Dogger. Hey, um, with fiber optic technology being out for quite a while now, was there a reason for a delay other than financing? And um, at 12 centimeters, that's like a large rattlesnake or a small python. Um, and trying to go ahead and create that kind of length uh, to go ahead and move around, how is, is it going to be a flexible fiber optic or because it can be rigid or flexible, I guess, right? Yeah, so, th so the fiber optic will be placed um, basically at, the, at a focus point. So it, you won't have a 12 centimeter beam size. You, you'll just, you, you'll focus it in. So it'll, it'll be a normal uh, thickness of fi fi fiber okay. optic. All right, great. Um, uh, and, so, so I might have, uh, you had another question in there too, right? Well, the, the funding, because fiber optics has been around for quite a long time now, was is funding kind of an issue or just everything yeah. was working, didn't need it? Yeah, so each of the fibers probably will cost a bit, maybe about like 30, 40,000. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think it's the, partially it's, it's challenging to in, inject the light into the fiber, send it across, and also stabilize the fiber enough that you're not adding, like if there's thermal variations between the different fibers, you, it's gonna basically destroy your ability to get the fringe pattern out. Right. So there, there have been tests using fiber optics and interferometry. So one, um, some of these tests were done on Mauna Kea, up near the, the two Keck telescopes used to combine together as an interferometer. Right. And they were trying to combine some of the other telescopes um, on Mauna Kea in with the Kecks. And okay. so they uh, did some early tests with fiber optics then. Mm -hmm. um, and we one of our uh, French collaborators is also doing some uh, preliminary experimentation connecting uh, two of the existing Chara telescopes with fiber optics. And so they, they just succeeded in uh, getting fringes with two of our telescopes through fiber optics. So okay. we'll be using a different set of fibers for that, but it's uh, it's good news that it's, yeah. you know, it's potentially successful. So we're hoping. Exciting, and... exciting. <laughs> Dr. Schaefer, uh, can, you, can you tell us why uh, some, some reasons why, or what made Mount Wilson an ideal location for the Chara array? You mentioned there were some other competing sites. I'm, I'm sure some of it, it's political and monetary, but uh, what are some like practical reasons that make Mount Wilson ideal for this? So yeah, Mount Wilson is is known for having uh, fairly good seeing. So that was one consideration that you you want a fairly stable atmosphere. And the other that was um, came into play is is actually even though it is potentially a downside being so close to the city of Los Angeles in terms of light pollution. But you also have easy access for um, supplies and equipment that if you need to replace something, you could just dri drive down the mountain, buy your you know, uh, piece of equipment that failed and drive back up and install it. So, <laughs> and um, yeah, and then there's always politics and these choices too. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the, the other sites that were had been considered were also uh, fairly good sites, and some of them actually have interferometers on them too. <laughs> so. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. How do you, who comes up with all these names of all these stars? <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the star names like like uh, like Sigma Orionis or something, right? It's so it's from um, yeah. the, the, their naming convention. So typically, the ones that have like the names rather than the numbers are are labeled by the constellation that they're in, and then they get a Greek letter based on brightness, basically. <laughs> so and then okay. once you go too faint, they get some. Uh, HD number. So it's, I think it's the International Astronomical Union that sets all the naming conventions. I didn't see Ken's hand, just... but someone said he had his hand up. And Shane, too. And Shane, too. Did, Kenji, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I, I asked my question. Thank you, Daryl. You did. Okay. Oh, okay. And Shane? Uh, yeah, Shane. I was just I was just trying to tally as you were going through the tour how many bounces the light path involves before it gets to the instruments. Do you have that number offhand? Um, I think it's about 20. 20 so yeah, probably. it's kind of amazing. amazing that we still have enough light to get fringes on the other side. So yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. Is, is there, do you have numbers for like how much light is lost over that? Oh, uh, I think it's probably in kind of like I, I can I can look up to get a better number, but a rough estimate maybe like ninety percent of the light is lost. Is, is lost? Lost? Yeah. It's <laughs> lost. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But on um, each reflection, you lose a little bit. So. <laughs> oh, okay. No wonder wow. you can look at bright things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It looked like a lot of those mirrors and or bounces were out in open air. How do you deal with dust? Oh yeah, so that, that's the, uh, in addition to, so, so the, the inner part of the lab is a, the building within the building. And so one reason to have it that way is to uh, keep the inside of the lab thermally stable. So all the air conditioning and heating pumps into the outer part of the lab. And so the inner lab is just still. Um, and it's also a partial clean room that if you go into it, you have to wear booties and, um, try to keep it as clean as possible. <laughs> so um, it does just um, does accumulate. You can uh, CO2 the mirrors and clear them off. Oh, uh, no sneezes allowed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Stop <laughs> shedding skin cells. <laughs> okay. Um, so if there's no other questions, um, we can go to the results of our... Actually, one, one, one more question. Sure, Kenji, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, you were talking about the close proximity to LA and the light pollution. So is that is the light pollution a limiting, created like a limiting magnitude that you can observe with the Chara array? Or is it the size of those one meter telescopes that limit your magnitude? Yeah, and because we're we're bouncing the starlight off for so many mirrors, we're actually limited by the uh, amount of starlight getting in, not not by the background. So we're looking at relatively bright stars. Um, a lot of them that are naked eyed stars that you can see. Um, so yeah, so for for us having this uh, you know bright, bright background from LA doesn't inhibit us. So because we're looking at fairly bright stars anyway. So. Okay. Like, so, yeah. like talking like magnitude four and brighter uh, or? So we can go down to, um, okay, so so for for these science instruments, we can get down to about like eighth magnitude and that's H okay. magnitude at H or in the near infrared or the vis visible. If you're actually recording the fringes in the near infrared, you can go down to uh, if you have a very red star that's uh, like bright and visual and fainter in the infrared, you can um, we can uh, like lock the adaptive optic system down to about uh, depending on conditions uh, a V magnitude of about like twelve to fourteen. But okay. the, the whatever brightness like that you're recording the fringes at the like the near in that case the near infrared brightness has to be brighter than about eighth magnitude. Okay. Yeah kind of visible-ish almost. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah in, the, in the H and K bands, you shouldn't see the light pollution anyway. In the near infrared, the sky should just be basically pitch black. Yeah, yeah. And, and then in the in, at the visible wavelengths, we're 
have to stay brighter than V of about eighth magnitude if you're recording fringes there. So yeah, good point. Yeah. I have a question. What's the most surprising result? What's the result that really like made you stand up, take notice, shake your We fist? had that question, Jeff. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. It, <coughs> it was the uh, it was the disc. Tell them quickly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so this was uh uh at least for a um a visual perspective, it was uh seen for this the first time this uh uh, eclipsing binary that has this disk of material moving through it. So it was just a very work. dramatic image that came across. What was I was the like, most wow, surprising we actually see didn't this. work out. What? Go the other way. what was the most surprising thing that didn't work out? <laughs> yeah, so so I think um so one thing that maybe was a little bit different from what we expected, if we, we look at um say these uh rapidly rotating stars that um, you can see that the poles are flattened and the equators are bulged out. Um, and you look at the surface brightness on there, there's, uh, because the, the, the equator is further from the center of the star than the poles, they'll appear cooler. And so one of the interesting things that we found out, um, there's a, a theory that predicts what the surface brightness should be. And so we, uh, by actually getting these observations, uh, there were some tweaks to that theory to actually explain the observed brightness distribution on the star rather than, so the, gra the gravity darkening law had to get a new coefficient, which was kind of a neat, uh, neat impact. <laughs> okay. Any other? I'm excited Carol? to see the active nuclei yes. stuff. That's Carol, just, just an observation for amateur astronomers like me who just like to go out and set up your telescope. If you type uh, Sigma Orionis into Sky Safari Pro, it will come up and it's very near Orion's belt, very near the Horsehead Nebula. This is one of the stars that you're imaging, Gail? Yeah, it was one okay. of the binary stars with a one very close orbit. Well, okay, that's good to know. Yeah, so, it's, it's in a little cluster of young stars too, so. Yes. Okay. So Gail, you mentioned that everybody that works on the project is actually uh, am I saying this right? Employed by Georgia State University? Yeah. So where do you guys live? You... We live out here in California. So we're we're the uh, California Georgia State staff. <laughs> so... Okay, no, but you understood the question. It's like it. Yeah. <laughs> you're all from there, but okay, but so everybody yeah. lives here in LA. And yeah. Yeah, so, to work every day. Yeah, okay. and then we have, um, you know, there, there's some there's some people in the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy who are based in Atlanta, and then the staff out at Chara permanently lives out here. So we're all California residents. So just employed by an out of state employer. Okay, that that was that was uh, I just didn't make sense to me that everybody's from Georgia State University, but the, the yeah it's out here. yeah. So what's this? Next, thank you. Society? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I just say done? thank you so much. It was very enlightening. It was wonderful. To hear. It's like absolutely just some of the stuff way over my head, but it's brilliant <laughs> just, uh, just to, to hear you guys talking and, and seeing this is like is wonderful. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Yeah, so you mentioned, you so mentioned that you don't have to use all of the telescopes and in, in the that the scientists who rent the time, do they did they come there? Can they do that remote? How do they get their data if it's not uh, Georgia State actually taking the data, if it's somebody, other scientists who booked time? Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, two ways. Back, back pre-pandemic, a lot of people would actually come out on site and observe here. But we always had a remote observing capability where basically you connect into a computer that can control the instruments on the mountain. So it's connected through a, uh, a VNC okay. uh, machine. So you log onto that and you can um, uh, connect through uh, up to the mountain and control all the science instruments from there. So we always have at least the array operator on the mountain and right. they're in charge of uh, pointing the telescopes, locking the adaptive optic systems. And once all the telescopes are aligned on the star, they let the uh, observer know, and right. then they can start taking observations. So it, it kind of works the same whether you're remote or on the mountain. And once the pandemic hit, like we closed down for a little while, but when we reopened, it was remote only observing. 
So basically you had the array operated by themselves and everybody else connecting in remotely. Um, it, even for the staff out here, if like I had an observing night, I would be home instead of up on the mountain. Okay. Now we have a little bit more flexibility in that. Don, one last question. Yes. Is, are there any YouTube videos about Shara that people can watch like NASA does a lot? Oh, we have, um, we have some media, let's uh, I'll post a link in the site of some of the videos we have that have been made about Chara. Um, so not that, I don't think any are on YouTube, but there's, should be some videos This one's about there. to be. I think there's an LAS presentation going on. Yeah, this one's about to be on YouTube. <laughs> yes. So we'll, we'll so post one. that one here too. <laughs> it has been so far. We're, we're still live, so well, that's cool. Maybe the website of Chara has something we can look at. Okay. We'll send you the link. Can you see the chat? She posted the link in the chat, Don. Oh, okay. Or maybe like social media links or anything? Well, the, the museum, there's the museum up on the mountain that's really very informative. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Ne next to the um, 100 inch dome, we have a little Chara exhibit hall um, with uh, computer screens uh, describing how the array works and some, highlighting some of the science uh, results there. Is it off topic to ask you what your next thing that you really want to tackle is? I mean, beyond Chara. Yeah, so I think the um, the main things, like a lot of people who are involved in uh, doing observations with interferometers, uh, always want to, uh, the two main things are you want um, higher angular resolution, so longer baselines, you want more telescopes uh, so that you can combine the light in more ways, and you want better sensitivity. <laughs> And so one of the ideas that's being um, formulated in the community, maybe in you know, 10, 20 years or so, is to build a, um, uh, an array called the Planet Formation Imager. And so this would actually, uh, one of the science goals of it would to really peer into these um, circumstellar disks around young stars and actually see these planets in the acts of for formation around That's the stars. awesome. Thank you. Really excited. So even in interferometry, it's aperture fever, bigger, bigger, bigger. Yes. <laughs> VLPI All right, great. Is that was that was fantastic. That was really fantastic. Um, yeah. Let's. Uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I'm going to uh, close the uh, the raffle. Anyone want to get their last minute? Uh, looks Did like. It looks like there's a lot. So like, Did I you put I'm Gail in the raffle? Is Gail going to win a door prize? I don't know. Did you put your name and email in there? Yeah, Gail, get in the raffle. Oh, okay, yeah, I haven't had, uh, I'm filling it out now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the, sure you're there. Is the URL in the chat? I don't see it. Yes, yeah. it's there. I just posted it again. That's the form site one. Yep, so I'll, it's very simple. Name, email. Yeah, I'm name, in there. Serial number. <laughs> okay. Well, you guys uh, uh, chat amongst yourselves for a moment, and I will get the data and uh, put it in the spread. Put it in the spreadsheet, and we'll. Oh yeah, we I, were asking. I did, not, uh, I did not see Alicia though. Um, I don't know what our prizes are no. going to be. Uh, Daryl, we were yes. we were talking about looking for somebody who might be who knows about merchandising. Maybe we know somebody in the group or. Uh, talk okay. about the merchandising. Uh, if anybody out there uh, knows anything about like clothing merchandising, uh, we're looking for somebody to help help us control the uh, uh, on the website for getting uh, um, the, all of the um, you know you know what I'm talking about uh, getting a brain brain here. <laughs> just to help out with the um, um, people wanting to buy things from the website. The printful, it's our it's our merchandise site, right? All yeah, the stuff you can yeah. All the oh, stuff yeah. you can order, right? Yep. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Gail. You rock. Yeah, thank you very much. This is fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Gail. That was a, that was really awesome. It was better than any Chara talk I could have done. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, now, now, Tim, you know you can talk about almost anything and make it <laughs> very fascinating. Make it <laughs> yeah, but I'm just making stuff up. She actually knows what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. Huh? Oh, <laughs> but, but Jeff, she's so much better looking than Tim is. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh so God. I'm uh, going to share my screen here. That beard is something. <laughs> That's right. Majestic. Majestic. If you want to see me in my wizard's outfit, you've got to come to the Halloween Science Night on October 29th at Garvey. Okay. <laughs> okay, can everyone see that spreadsheet? It's, yeah. it's empty. It is empty. It's empty. <laughs> it is empty. Nobody wants to answer your question. Nobody wants anything. I'm Everybody a loser home. again. Home. I'm a loser we again. Okay, so since I dropped the name in, the first winner comes up is Carol Karch. Um, uh, uh, yeah, she's here. <laughs> she's, she's here. Uh, <laughs> Greg, Greg Thompson? Are you oh, there? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm here. How about yeah. that? No, I, you didn't win. I'm asking you, can you take everyone's name down? Because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Alicia, Alicia is not here uh, to do that part. Uh, and so... Okay, so it was Carol. Carol Karch was number one. You yes. didn't win. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, no, I won the volunteer We're all contest. Win something. Yeah. You don't know what. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? Won a night on the Chara Ray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think she's number nineteen. Yeah. Amazing. Nineteen. Nineteen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. When I delete, we got the next one. Tim Thompson. Hey, Timmy. Oh, boy. Tim Jeez. Thompson, you've won a hat. <laughs> Just what I need. <laughs> you've I won a the, wizard outfit. I want, to see the Excel, I want to see the Excel formula to generate that winner. He gets his, he gets his 20th hat. That's right. <laughs> okay, we're going to delete Tim. We've got a new winner. Andrew Sway. Winner. Andrew. Is Andy here? Yep, I'm here. All right. Great. You won something. Uh, we, won something. Don't know, we don't know what we're winning. Do we know how many prizes we're supposed to give out? Um, she usually has about five, I think. Tim, you want an invitation to next month's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do we have, Greg? Three so far? Three so far. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out, before you exit the spreadsheet, I need you to save the way it was before you started deleting the names because we need to preserve the email addresses. I have those, that's fine. Perfect, so I've got three so far, Carol, Tim, and Andrew, go ahead. Okay, I will. And this is Andrew. Stan. Stan Thompson, here he is. I am still here. Yay. I hope it's a laser. You won something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that formula is going to focus in on the Thompson, so I should be next. <laughs> <laughs> See, where's, where's Stan? Line 21. 21. 21, 21. Thank you. Okay. Phil right, Taylor. Here. Phil Taylor. Oh, Philip. Hey, Phil. All right, Phil. Phil's already got everything. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, he you want a telescope? The, he won the interferometer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, so that was five. That is, in fact, five. Okay. Indeed. All right. So uh, put these back for Craig. You did a great job, Daryl. Thank you. I'll I'll uh, I have the other. I'll send it to you, Craig. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, what I'll do is just. Uh, add a column and mark who the winners were in what order and send it back to you. Okay. And then, uh, all right. And someday you will find out what we won. That's, That's right. right. Oh. You find out in the mail. Alicia okay, is so more entertaining. Think, uh, you'll, Daryl did okay. Okay. All right. You'll, you'll get an email from Alicia at some point saying, here's what you won. That's right. Coming in the mail. <laughs> okay. Uh, Check them so out. let's let's we, let's stop the meeting officially, and then uh, you know mm. we can hang and talk. And Gail, you can take off um, 
or hang if you've got more questions. But Gail, if you're still I'm sure you have, there, sure you have you a life as well. sharing your screen at the moment because we're looking at a blank spreadsheet. Oh, you really? Okay. Let me get rid of it. <laughs> Gail, 